History Podcast. Please listen to part one, as part two won't make much sense. We will have a brief recap and a timeline just to get you back up to speed. As always, any new podcast relies on the generosity of his listeners. Please share, tell your friends. Follow us on social media. We're on Facebook. That's facebook.com forward slash brief history podcast. And on Twitter at B History Podcast. Like, share, follow, tell your friends. All these details will be in the podcast notes. Please look out for them. The Indian Rebellion of 1857 began as a mutiny of sepoys of the East Indian Company's army on the 10th of May 1857 in the town of Moret and soon escalated into other mutinies and civilian rebellions, largely in the Upper Ganjanic plain of central India, with major hostilities confined to present-day Uttar Pradesh, Bina and the South Madhya Pradesh and the Delhi region. The, the, the rebellion posed a considerable threat to company power in that region and was soon contained with the fall of Galwa on the 20th of June 1858. The rebellion is also known as India's First War of Independence, the Great Rebellion, the Indian Mutiny, the Revolt of 1857, the Uprising of 1857, the Sepoy Rebellion and the Sepoy Mutiny. The mutiny was a result of various grievances. However, the flash point was reached when the soldiers were asked to bite off paper cartridges for their rifle, which were greased with animal fat, namely beef and pork. This was and is against the religious beliefs of Hindus and Muslims alike. Other regions of the company controlled India, such as Bengal, Bombay, and Madras Presidency, soon remained largely calm. In the Punjab, the Sikh princes by the company providing soldiers and support. The largely princely states of Hyderabad, Mysore, Tranakore and Kashmir, as well as smaller ones of Rajputana, did not join the rebellion. In some regions, such as Uda, the rebellion took on the attributes of a patriotic, patriotic revolt against the European presence. Maratha leaders such as Lakshambai, the Rani of Jahasani, became folk heroes in the nationalist movement in India half a century later. However, they themselves generated no coherent ideology for the new order. The rebellion led to the dissolution of the East Indian Company in 1858. It also led to the British to recognise the army, the financial system and administration in India, recognise that they needed to reorder and recast the army in a number of different ways. India was therefore directly governed by the Crown as a new British Raj. March 1857 saw the mutiny at Bahampur. May 10th, mutiny at Miret. The 11th, mutineers advanced on Delhi. May 30th, open mutineers across the country. June 4th, Benares mutiny. June 5th, Kampur mutiny. June 8th, Battle of Badr Ki Sira. June 27, Camp Paul Massacre. July the 10th, Havelock Mogbog Column of a thousand troops advances on Camp Paul. June 15, Havelock's Column fights two battles close to Camp Paul at Agum and the Pandu Nandi and wins both. 1857, women and children are massacred at Camp Paul. July 16, Nicholas's Common marches on Delhi. July 25th, Havelock marches on Lucknow. July 29th, Battle of Una, Bhishmaji. August 5th, Second Battle of Bhishwanjani. August 12th, Battle of Baraka Kashaki. August 16th, Battle of Bintar. August 25th, Battle of Nojagar. September 14th, Assault on Delhi. September 16th, Columns Take Delhi. September 21st, Emperor and Princes are captured and officially surrender. September 23rd, Battle of Alambar. September 24th, Battle of Balashar. September 25th, First Relief of Lucknow. November 16th, Battle of Noir. 
September the 25th, campaign ends with the capture of the fort of Durana. March 21st, Lucknow completely recaptured. May 1st, services of thanksgiving are held throughout the kingdom. In June, sepoys under General Wheeler in Kampur, present day Kampur, rebelled and besieged the um, European entrenchments. Wheeler was not only a veteran and respected soldier, but also married to a high caste Indian lady. He had relied on his own prestige and his cordial relations with Naha Sahab to thwart rebellion and took comparatively few measures to come prepare for fortifications and lay in supplies and administration. The besiege endured three weeks of the siege of Kampur with little water or food, suffering continuous casualties to men, women and children. On the 25th of June, Nana Shahab soon made an offer of safe passage to Allahabad. With barely three days food rations remaining, the British agreed provided they could keep their small arms and that the evacuation should take place in daylight on the morning of the 27th. Did Nana Shah have wanted their evacuation to place take place on the night of the 26th? Early in the morning of the 27th, the M European party left their entrenchment and made their way to the river where boats provided by Nana Shah was waiting to take them to Allahabad. Several sepoys who had stayed loyal to the company were removed by the mutineers and killed, either because of their loyalty or because they had become Christian. A few injured British officers trading the column were also apparently hacked to death by the angry sepoys. After the European party had largely arrived at the dock, which was surrounded by sepoys positioned on both banks of the Ganges with clear lines of fire, firing broke out and the boats were abandoned by their crew and caught or were set on fire using pieces of red hot charcoal. The British party tried to push the boats off but all except three remained stuck. One boat with over a dozen wounded men initially escaped but was later grounded, was caught by mutineers and pushed back down the river towards the carnage at Kampur. Towards the end, rebel cavalry rode into the river to finish off any survivors. After the firing ceased, the survivors were rounded up and the men shot. By the time the massacre was over, most of the male members of the party were dead while the surviving women and children were removed and held hostage. They were later killed in the Buhagi massacre. Only four men eventually escaped alive from Kampur on one of the boats. Two private soldiers, both of whom died later during the rebellion, a lieutenant and Captain Mowbray Thompson, who wrote a first-hand account of the experience the title of the story of Kampur, London 1859. Whether the firing was planned or accidental remains unresolved. Most early histories assume it was planned either by Naha Naha Shahab, as proposed by Kaya Mamsa, or that Tatia Tope and Brigadier Gwala Pasha planned it without the Naha Shahab's knowledge, proposed by G.W. Forrest. The stated reasons for the planned nature are the speed at which the Naha Shahab agreed to the British conditions put forward by Mowbray and Thompson himself and the firepower arranged around the gap which were far in excess of which was necessary to guard the European troops. Most histories agree on this. During their trial, Tachieto denied the existence of any such plan and described the incitement of the following terms. The Europeans had already boarded the boat and he, Tachieto, raised his right hand to signal their departure. That very moment, someone from the crowd blew a loud bugle, which created disorder in the ongoing bewilderment. The boatmen jumped off the boats. The rebels started shooting indiscriminately. Nana Shihab, was, who was staying in Savadej Curve bungalow nearby, was informed of what was happening and immediately came to stop it. Some British histories allow that it might well have been a result of an accident or error. Someone accidentally or maliciously fired a shot. The panic-stricken British opened fire and it became impossible to stop the massacre. The surviving women and children were taken to Nana Shihab and then confined first to the Sabah Dekati and then to the home of the local magistrate clerk, where they were uh, joined by refugees from Fatehur. Overall, five men 
and 206 women and children were confined to the Bagra for about two weeks. In one week, 25 were brought to out there due to dysentery and cholera. Meanwhile, Company Relief Force that had been advanced from Ahalabad defeated the Indians by the 15th of July. It was clear that Nahashawab would not be able to hold Kampur and the decision was made by Nahan, Nana Shahab and other leading rebels that the hostages must be killed. After the Sepoys refused to carry out this order, two Muslim butchers, two Hindu peasants and one of Nana's bodyguards went into the Bahurbi. Armed with knives and hatchets, they murdered the women and children. After the massacre, the walls were covered in bloody blood handprints and the floor littered with fragments of human limbs. The dead and dying were thrown down a nearby well, where the well was not full. The 50-foot deep wall was filled with the remains to within six feet to the top, and the remainder were thrown into the Ganges. Historians have given many reasons for this act of cruelty, with company forces approaching Campbell and soon believing that they would not advance if there was no hostages to stay. Their mergers were ordered or perhaps it was to ensure that no information was leaked after the corporal of Campbell. Other historians have suggested that killing was an attempt to undermine the Naha Shahab's relationship with the British. Perhaps it was due to fear, the fear of being recognised by some of the prisoners for having taken part in the earlier firings. The killing of the women and children proved to be a mistake. The British public were a go and anti-imperial and pro-Indian proponents lost all their support. Kampur became a war cry for the British and their allies for the rest of the conflict. Nana Shihab disappeared near the end of the rebellion, it was not known what had happened to him. Other British accounts state that indiscriminate punitive measures were taken in early June, two weeks before the murder at Bimahaniga. After those of both Mercia and Dali, specifically by Lieutenant Colonel George Smith Neal, the Madras Fusiliers, which was a European unit, commanded at Al-Alabad while moving towards Kampur. At the nearby town of Fetfa, a mob had attacked and murdered the local European population. On this pretext, Neil ordered all villages beside the Grand Truck Road to be burned and their inhabitants hanged. Neil's methods were, quote, ruthless and horrible. End quote, and far from intimidating the population may well have induced previously undecided sea poisoned communities to revolt. Neil was killed in action at Lucknow on the 26th of September was never called to account for his punitive measures, though contemporary British sources lionised him and his gallant blue caps. When the British retook Campbell, the soldiers took their sea poisoned prisoners to the Berangi and forced them to lick the bloodstains from the walls and floor. They then hanged or blew from the cannons, which was the traditional Munga punishment for mutiny, the majority of the sepoy prisoners. Also, some, although some claim the sepoys took no actual part in the killings themselves, they not, did not act to stop it, and that was acknowledged by Captain Thompson after the British departed Campbell for a second time. Very soon after the events in Murat, rebellion erupted in the state of Awada, also known as Hodor in modern day Uttar Prendash, which had been annexed barely a year before. The British commissioner resident at Lucknow, Sir Henry Lawrence, had enough time to fortify his position inside the residency compound. The company forces numbered some 1,700 men, including local sepoys. The rebels' assaults were unsuccessful and they began to barrage all artillery and musket fire into the compound. Lawrence was one of the first casualties. The rebels tried to besiege the walls with explosives and bypass them via underground tunnels that led to underground close combat. After 90 days of siege, numbers of company forces reduced to 300 loyal sepoys, 250 British soldiers and 550 non-combatants. On September the 25th, a relief column under command of Sir Henry Havelock and accompanied by Sir James Outram, with whom, in theory, was his superior, fought its way from Campor to Lucknow in a brief campaign in which the numerically small column defeated rebel forces in a series of increasingly large battles. 
this became known as the first release of Not Now. And this, this force was not strong enough to break the siege or extricate themselves, and then soon was forced to join the garrison. In October, another larger force army under the new commander in chief, Sir Colin Campbell, was finally able to relieve the garrison, and on the 18th of November, they evacuated the defended enclave within the city, the women and children leaving first. They then conducted an orderly withdrawal to Campbell, and where they defeated an attempt by Tavita to, to recapture the city in a settled ba second battle at Campbell. Early in 1858, Campbell once again advanced on Lucknow with a large army, though this time seeking to suppress the rebellion in Radwa. He was aided by a large Nepalese contingent advancing from north under Jang Behurda and was decided to side with the company in December 1857. Campbell's advance was slow and methodical and drove the large but disorganised rebel army from Lucknow with few casualties of his own. Nevertheless, this allowed large numbers of rebels to disperse into Adwa and Campbell was forced to spend the summer and autumn dealing with scattered pockets of resistance while losing men to the heat, disease and gridder actions. The Central Indian Campaign of 1858 Jahansi was an Maharashi ruler which ruled princely state of Balatika when the Rahaj of Jahanith died without a biblical male heir in 1853. It was annexed to the British Raj by the Governor General of India under the doctrine of lapse. His widow, Rani Lakshmi Bar, protested against the denial of the rights of their adopted son. When war broke out, Jahansi quickly became a a centre of rebellion. A small group of company officials and their families took refuge in Jahani's fort and Irani negotiated their evacuation. However, they were left the fort. They were massacred by the rebels over which Irani had no control. The Europeans suspected Irani of complicity despite her repeated denials. By the end of 1857, the company had lost control of much of Bukanda and eastern Rajasthan. The Bengal army units in the area have rebelled, massacred, or marched to take part in the battles for Delhi and Kampur. The many princely states which made up this area began wearing against themselves. In September and October 1857, Narani led the successful defence of Rahansi against the invading armies of the neighbouring Rajhajis of Dhatia and Orchia. On the 3rd of February, Rose broke the three-month siege of Sangor. Thousands of local villagers welcomed him as a liberator, freeing them from rebel occupation. In March 1858, the Central Indian Field Force led by Sir Hugh Rose advanced on the laid siege of Jasani. The company forces captured the city, but the Rani fled in disguise. After being driven from Russia, uh, Jasani and Karpi on the 1st of June 1857 to 1858, Rani Laksami, Bar, and a group of Maharathi rebels captured the fortress city of Godawa from the Sikandi rulers, who were British allies. This might have reinvigorated the rebellion, but the Central Indian Field Force very quickly advanced against the city. The Rani died on the 17th of June, the second day of the Battle of Godawa, probably killed by a carbine shot from the 8th Hussars, according to the account of three independent Indian representatives. The company forces captured Gullawar within the next three days. In descriptions of the scene of her last battle, she was compared to Joan of Arc by some commentators. Indoor Colonel Henry Durand, the then company resident of Indoor, had brushed away any possibility of an uprising in Indoor. However, on the 1st of July, sepoys in Holkar's army revolted and opened fire on the pickets of Jaipur Cavalry. When Colonel Travers broke forward to charge, Burpal Cavalry refused to follow. The Burpal Infantry also refused orders and instead levelled their guns at European sergeants and officers. Since all possibilities of mountain infected deterrent were lost, Durand decided to gather up all the European residents and escape, although 39 European residents at Indoor was killed. 
in the Punjab. What was then referred to by the British as the Punjab was a very large administration division centred on in Lahore, include not only the present day Indian and Pakistani Punjabi regions, but also the northwest frontier districts bordering Afghanistan. Much of the region had been the Sikh Empire ruled by Ranjit Singh until his death in 1839. The kingdom had been fallen into disorder with court factions and the Kasali, the Sikh army, condemned for power at the Lahore Dunbar court. After two Anglo-Sikh wars, the entire region was annexed by the East Indian Company in 1849. In 1857, the region still contained the highest number of both European and Indian troops. The inhabitants of the Punjab were not as sympathetic to the sepoys as they were elsewhere in India, which limited many of the outbreaks in the Punjab to disjointed uprisings by regiments or sepoys isolated from each other. In some garrisons, notably for his support, indecision on the part of the senior European officers allowed the sepoys to rebel, but the sepoys then left the area, mostly heading for Delhi. At the most important garrison, that of Peshawar, Close to the Afghan border, many comparatively junior officers ignored their normal commander, the elderly General Reed, and took divisive action. They intercepted the sepoys' mail, thus preventing their coordinating an uprising, and formed a force known as the Punjab Movable Column to move rapidly to suppress any revolts that occurred. When it became clear from the intercepted correspondent that some of the sepoys at Peshawar were on the point of open revolt, the four most dissatisfied Bengal native regiments were disarmed by the two British infantry regiments in the cantonment backed by artillery on the 22nd of May. This decisive act induced many local chieftains to side with the British. Jhulam in Punjab was also a centre of resistance against the, the British. Here, 35 British soldiers of Her Majesty's 14th Regiment, South Wales Borders, died on the 7th of July 1857. To commemorate this victory by St John's Church, Jhulam was built, and the names of those 35 British soldiers are carved on a marble le lectern present at that church. The final large-scale military uprising in the Punjab took place on the 19th, the 9th of July, where most of a brigade of sepoys at Scalp Top rebelled and began to move to Delhi. They were intercepted by John Nicholson with an equal British force as they tried to cross the Ravi River. After fighting steadily but unsuccessfully for several hours, the sepoys tried to fall back across the river, but came trapped on the island. Three days later, Nicholson annihilated the 1100 trapped sepoys in the Battle of Trimmer Gap. Some regiments in frontier garrisons subsequently rebelled but were isolated among hostile Pachu villages and tribes. There were several mass executions amounted to several hundred of sepoys from units which rebelled or who deserted in the Punjab and northern western frontier provinces during June and July. British had been recruiting irregular units from Sikh and Patch to communities even before the first unrest among the Bengal units, and the number of these greatly increased during the rebellion. 34,000 fresh levies eventually being raised. At one stage, faced with the need to send troops to reinforce the besiegers at Delhi, the Commissioner of the Punjab, Sir John Lawrence, suggested heading the convented prize of Peshawar to Dost Mohammed Khan of Afghanistan in return for the Pledge of Friendship. The British agents in Peshawar and the adjacent districts were horrified. Referring to the massacre of a retreating British army in 1840, Herbert Enderwines wrote, quote, Dost Mohammed would not be a moral Afghan if he did not assemble or a day to be gone in India and to follow after us an enemy. Europeans cannot retreat. Cabell would be again. In the event of Lord Cannon insisting on Pashwal being held and Dost Mohammed, whose relations with British had been equivocal for over 30 years, remain neutral. Unquote. It's in September 1858. Ra Mohammed Nawaz Khan Kural 
head of the Karul tribe, led an insurrection in the Delhi Bar district between the Sucha, Ravi and Chenab rivers. The rebellions held the jungles of Karaji and had some influence success against the British forces in the area besieging Major Crawford Campbellman at Kachuantani. A squadron of Punjabi cavalry sent by Sir John Lawrence raised the siege. Ahmed Khan was killed, but the insurgents found a new leader in Mur Bahale Fatwana, who maintained the uprising for three months until government forces penetrated the jungle and scattered the rebels themselves. Landlords of the Rajputani clan of Rajputs, Talakur Dobby district, Kampur played a prominent part in the rebellion. On hearing of the uprisings against British rule in the surrounding districts of Kanchapur, Azra and Badaras, the Rajputs of Durali organised themselves into a vast armed force and attacked the company all over the region. They also cut the company communications along the Banaras Ajara road and advanced towards the former Burani state. In the first encounter with British regular troops, the Rajputs suffered heavy losses but withdrew in order. In grouping themselves, they made a big to capture Banaras. In the meantime, Azwa had been besieged by another large force of rebels. The company was unable to send reinforcements to Azwajia due to the challenge posed by the Dolphi Rajputs. A clash became inevitable and the company attacked the Rajputs with the help of the Sikhs and the Hindustani cavalry at the end of June 1857. The Rajputs were handicapped as the torrential monsoon rain soaked their supplies of gunpowder. The Rajputs, however, bitterly opposed the company advance with swords and spears and a few serviceable guns and muskets they had found. The company took about five miles north of Rajas as a place called Prashani in Anab. The Rajputs were driven back with heavy losses against the Romari River. The British army crossed the river and sacked every Rajput village in the area. A few months later, Kumwad Singh of Janaspur district, Anara, Badar, advanced and occupied Azapuna. The Manas army sent out against him was completely defeated outside Ajawa. The company rushed reinforcements and there was a furious battle in which the Rajputs of Dari helped Kumwa Singh with their di- distinct relative. Kumwa Singh had to withdraw and the Rajputs became the subject of cruel cool reprisals by the company. The leader, the Chaberni Rubber, invited to the conference and, the treacher- and treacherously arrested by the company troops, which had surrounded the place in Sajpur village in 1858. All were summarily executed by hanging from a mango tree, along with nine of their other followers. The dead bodies were further shot with muskets and left hanging from the trees. After a few days, the, rev- the bodies were taken down by the villagers and cremated. On the 25th of July, rebellion erupted in the garrison of Dinpa. The rebel- rebels quickly moved towards the city of Nara, enjoyed by Kumwa Singh and his men. Mr. Boyle, a British railway engineer in Anara, had already prepared his house for defence against such attacks, particularly because he was a railway engineer. As the rebels approached Amra, all European residents took refuge in Boyle's house. A siege soon ensured and 50 local sepoys defended to the use a house against artillery and musketry from the rebels. On the 29th of July, 400 men were sent out from Dimpur to relieve Anara, but the their force was ambushed by rebels around a mile away from the siege house, several defeated and driven back. On the 30th of July, Major Vincent Orr, who was going up the river with his troops and guns, reached Buxar and heard about the siege. He immediately disembarked his guns and troops, the 5th Fusiliers, and started marching towards Ara. On the 2nd of August, some 16 miles short of Ra, the Major was ambushed by rebels. After an intense fight, the 5th Fusiliers charged and stormed the rebel position successfully. On the 3rd of August, Major Orr and his men reached the siege house and successfully ended the siege. The Aftermath 
The authorities in British colonies with the Indian population, sepoy or civilian took measures to secure themselves against copycat uprisings in the Strait Settlements and in Trinidad, the annual wholesale processions were banned. Riots broke out in the penal settlements in Burma and a settlement in Penang. The loss of a musket provoked a near riot and security was boosted, essentially in locations with Indian convicted populations. From the end of 1857, the British had begun to gain ground again. Lucknow was retaken in, 18, in March 1858. On the 8th of July 58, a peace treaty was signed and the rebellion ended. The last rebels were defeated in Gulawar on the 20th of June 1858. By 1859, rebel leaders Buk Khan and Nana Shiab had soon either been slain or had fled. The rebel murder of women, children and wounded soldiers at Kampur and the subsequent printing of the sieges are British paper, in British papers left many British soldiers seeking revenge. As well as hanging mutineers, the British had some, quote, blown from cannon, oh, quote, which was an old Mongol punishment adopted many years before in India. Sentenced rebels were then tied over mouths of cannons and blown to pieces when the gun was fired. Most of the British press outraged by the reports of rape and the killings of civilians and wounded soldiers did not advocate clemency of any kind. Governor General Cannon ordered moderation in dealing with native sensibilities and earned the scornful title Clemency Cannon from the press and later parts of the British public. In terms of sheer numbers, the casualties were much higher on the Indian side. A letter published after the fall of Delhi in the Bombay Telegraph was produced in British papers testified to the scale of Indian casualties. Quote, All the cities people founded within the walls of the city of Delhi when our troops entered were benefited on the spot and the number was considerable as many may were supposed where I tell you that in some houses 40 and 50 people were hiding. These were not mutineers, but residents of the city who were trusted and well-known, marred rule from pardon. I'm glad to say that they were disappointed. End quote. Edward Verber, a 19-year-old officer, recorded his experience. Quote, it was literally murder. I have seen many bloody and awful sights lately, but such as one I have witnessed yesterday, I pray I never see again. The women were all spared, but their screams and seeing their husbands and sons butchered was most painful. Heaven knows I feel no pity, but when old grey bearded men is brought and shot before your our very eyes, hard must be that a man's heart I think cannot look upon with indifference. End quote. Some British troops adopted a policy of no prisoners. When officer Thomas Lowe remembered on one occasion his unit had taken 76 prisoners, they were just too tired to carry on killing and needed a rest, he later recorded. Later, after a quick trial, the prisoners were lined up with a British soldier standing a couple of yards in front of them. On the order of fire, they all simultaneously shot, quote, swept from their earthly existence, unquote. The aftermath of the rebellion had been the focus of new work using Indian sources and population studies. In the last Mongol, historian William Dalrymple examines the effects of the Muslim population of Delhi after the city was retaken by the British and finds that intellectual and economic control of the city shifted from Muslim to Hindu hands because the British at that time saw an Islamic hand behind the mutiny. The scale of the punishment handed out by the British Army of Retribution was considered largely appropriate and justified in the British which is shocked by reports of atrocities carried out by British and European civilians and local Christians by the rebels. Accounts of the frequently reached hyperpolic register and according to Christopher Herbert, especially in the often repeated claim that the red year of 1857 marked a terrible break in British experience. Such was the atmosphere and national, quote, mood of retribution and despair, unquote, led to quote, almost universal approval, end quote, of the measures taken to pacify the revolt. The 
incidents of rape committed by Indian rebels against European women and girls that appalled the British public. These atrocities were often used to justify the British reaction to the rebels. British new pa- newspapers printed various eyewitness accounts of the rape of English women and girls. On such account, published by the Times regarding an incident where 48 British, British girls as young as 10 had been raped by Indian rebels in Delhi. Karl Marx later claimed that this was a propaganda stating that the account was written by a clergyman in Bangalore far from the events of the rebellion but produced no evidence to support this allegation. Individual incidents captured the public interest and were heavily reported to press. One such incident at that of General Wheeler's daughter Margaret began forced to live after a captured concubine, though this was reported in the Victorian public as Margaret killing her rapist herself. Another version of this story suggests that Margaret had been killed after a doctor had argued with his wife over her. The term sepoy or sepoyism became a derogatory term for the nationalists, especially in Ireland. Bangador Sudha was tried for the trees for, for treason by a military commission assembled by Delhi and exiled to Ran, a Rangoon where he died in 1862, bringing the Mughal dynasty to an end. In 1877, Queen Victoria took the title of Empress of India on the advice of Prime Minister and Minister Benjamin Disraeli. The rebellion saw the end of the British East India Company rule in India. In August, by the Government of Indian Act 1858, the company was formally dissolved and its ruling powers over India was transferred to the British Crown. A new British Government Department Indian Office was created to handle the governance of India and its head, the Secretary of State for India, was entitled, entrusted with formulating an Indian policy. The Governor-General of India gained a new title, the Viceroy of India, and implemented the policies devised by the Indian Office. Some former East Indian territories, such as the Strait Settlements, became colonies in their own right. The British colonial administration embarked on a programme of reform, trying to integrate Indian high, higher castes and rulers into the government and abolish attempts at westernisation. The Viceroy stopped land grabs, decreed rebellion, religious tolerance and admitted Indians into civilian Civil, civil service, albeit at subordinates. Essentially, the old East Indian Company bureaucracy remained, though there was a major shift in attitudes. In looking for the causes of mutiny, the authorities alighted to two things, rebellion and econ- economy. On the rebellion, it was felt that there had been too much interference where indigenous traditions, both Hindu and Muslim, on the economy, it was not believed that the previous attempt by the company to introduce free market competition had undermined traditional power structures and bonds of loyalty, placing the peasantry at the mercy of merchants and moneylenders. In consequence, the British Raj was constructed in part around a conservative agenda based on preservation of tradition and hierarchy. On a political level, it is also felt that the previous lack of consultation between rulers and ruled had yet another significant factor in tributing to the uprising. In consequence, the Indians were drained, drawn into government at local level, though there was a limited scale on crucial precedent which had been set with the creation of a new white-collar Indian elite. Further stimulated by the opening of universities at Calcutta, Bombay and Madras, a result of Indian Universities Act. So alongside the values of traditional and ancient India, a new professional middle class was starting to arise, in no way bound by the values of the past. Their ambition can be only have been stimulated by Victoria's proclamation of November 1858, in which it is expressly stated that, quote, we hold ourselves bound to the natives of our Indian territories by the same obligations of duty which bind us to our other subjects. It is our further will that our subjects of whatever creed or race 
by freely and partially admitted to offices in our service, the duties of which may be qualified by their education, ability and integrity duly to discharge. End quote. Acting on these sentiments, Lord Ripon, voice for Viceroy between 1880 to 85, extended the powers of local self-government and sought to remove racial practices in the law courts by the Ilbert Bill. But a policy as such liberal and progression as one term was revolutionary and backward and the next creating new elites and confirming old attitudes. The Ilbert Bill only had the effect of causing a white mutiny at the end of prospect of perfect equality by law. In 1886, measures were adopted to restrict Indian entry into the civil service. The Bengal army dominated the Indian army before 1857 and a direct result after the rebellion was the scaling back of the size of the Bengali contingent in the army. The Brahim presence in the Bengal army was reduced to the late 19th century because of their perceived primary role as mutineers. The British looked for increased recruitment in the Punjab from the Bengal army as a result of the apparent discontent that resulted in the Sepoy conflict. The rebellion transformed both the native and European armies of the British India. Of 74 regular Bengal native industry regiments in existence at the beginning of 1857, only 12 escaped mutiny or dis uh, disbandment. All 10 of the Bengal Light Cavalry regiments were lost. The old Bengal army had accordingly almost completely vanished from order of battle. These troops were replaced by new units recruited from Cass, hereto underutilised by the British from the minority so-called martial races, such as the Sikhs and the Gurkhas. The inefficiency of the old organisation, which is strange sepoys from the British officers, were addressed, and the post-1857 units were mainly organised on the irregular system. Before the rebellion, each Bengal native infantry regiment had 26 British officers who held every position and authority down to the second in command of each company. In irregular units, there were few European officers who associated themselves far more closely with their soldiers, while more responsibility was given to Indian officers. The British increased the ratio of British to Indian soldiers within India. From 1861, Indian artillery, artillery was replaced by British units, except for a few mountain batteries. The post-rebellion changes formed the basis of the military organisation of British India until the early 20th century. Thank you for listening to part two of the Indian Mutiny by Brief History podcast. As always, the success of this podcast relies on you, the listener. So please listen, subscribe, share, follow us on Twitter at Be History Podcast. We're on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Brief History Podcast. Please like, share, follow, rate us on iTunes and any other podcast site. As always, thank you. My name's Andrew Knight, I'm the narrator and the writer. Harry Edmondson is the composer and the producer. Thanks for listening, and as always, further information will be found in the podcast notes. Listen out for the next episode next week.